Morning everybody, how are you doing? It's Kirsty here uh, and we've also got Helen and Julie. Um, I was thinking about why did I do this as an online gathering today, invite two of my peers, Julie and Helen, to join in the conversation. Um, and I realised I, many of you who know me or have read any of my blogs or ponderings, um, I really think it's important that as facilitators and trainers, um, we're always continually learning and growing and expanding ourselves, whether that is as content matter experts or as um, in the facilitation training or coaching space. Um, so I thought it'd be a really good idea to get some others on board to have a conversation so we can talk a little more about um, our journeys. So where have we come from, um, how have we got here and what were sort of our learning journeys along the way. Um, for those of you who are listening, you're absolutely welcome to write us questions as we go and I will weave them in um, as, we, as we're chatting. So uh, the first thing I'd love each of Julie and Helen to do is introduce themselves and the question is who are you and uh, how do you describe what you do? Should we start from the north and work south? <laughs> Absolutely. Always, always start with the north. Um, so, uh, existential start to Monday morning, bloody hell. Um, so I'm Julie Driver, I'm founder of Future Blue and uh, the Facilitation Shindig. Um, how, what am I saying? How I got here? That's the yeah, good how start. do you describe what you do? <laughs> um, three parts to the business, one part coaching, one part facilitation, one part um, consultancy, um, what, what, whatever those things mean. Um, and uh, mostly I say that I work with people or organisations that are going through some sort of transition. Typically I'm working with folk who are um, either changing or trying to change or, you know, trying to grow or uh, those sorts of things. So, yeah, a lot of working with folk in transition. Cool. Thank you. Helen, uh, who are you and how do you describe what you Who do? am I? So I'm Helen Jewell and my business is called Jewell Facilitation. I struggled long and hard to think up that name. And uh, yeah, I what do I do? So I'm primarily a facilitator. I work in the house with different people who they're not really going through change necessarily. They are struggling to have productive discussions in some way, whether that's reviewing something that's already happened or creating, collecting ideas and creating plans for the future. There can be all sorts of different things. That's the sort of the, the bigger part of my business. I also do open workshops on how to do workshops and I do some uh, training for a larger training company as an associate. So that, and I've got a couple of collaborations with people and a few other bits and pieces, but yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Cool, and um, how I describe what I do. So School of Facilitation is in two parts. We have the corporates and the practitioners. So you're experiencing the practitioner side of the business right now, whereby it's all about growing, expanding practitioners' capability to facilitate, to train, to design learning, design workshops, and also to deliver really effectively. And then with corporates, um, many of you are either in corporates or work with corporates yourself. Um, they do a lot of their own design and delivery these days and have people who need to step in and uh, facilitate or train probably. So I do a lot of work with big global corporates um, supporting their, they're called L&D teams or capability teams and um, yeah, help grow those bods. That's how I describe what I do. Or I just have lots of fun, which is another way of describing it. <laughs> um, so what would be really great is, um, Helen, we'll, we'll go south to north. Um, where did your journey start? Oh, blimey. So uh, my background, if you like, I used to be a speech and language therapist. So I qualified over 20 years ago now, horrifyingly, uh, 22 years ago, in fact. And uh, shortly after qualifying, working in London for a bit, I went and did voluntary services overseas in Nepal. And I lived there for four years. And I, that's when I sort of got into the whole training and working with groups and facilitation. And, and part of that was I went through a whole load of training that VSO put volunteers on. And at the time, I don't know what it's called now, it was called participatory rural appraisal or participatory learning appraisal. And it was about this whole idea of involving people in 
in your you know what you're doing in group training sessions so it kind of started there and it's it's moved along through uh, me working in international development for a little while um, a number of different charities and it's been a sort of a gradual kind of moving away from speech therapy I haven't done that for about 10 years now and and into sort of really just more working with you know in facilitation and training and I sort of built that up over the years and then I started four years ago working for myself so post two children you know hitting 40 what shall I do now I'm gonna work for myself so yeah that's a kind of bit of a potted history I suppose but excellent yeah. and um Julie what's um where did you start your journey um it depends it, it depends where I start so um I, I began as a, a an HR practitioner and I was a really bad HR practitioner I was terrible because I'm not good at process and linear following procedure and you kind of need a lot of that. particularly you know I was sort of HR admin and you sort of needed some of that and I had a brilliant boss who just went yeah honey this is not for you <laughs> and she, she she put me on a um, uh, one of the change programs that was running as a as an internal change facilitator and there was an external company that were working with us and she said to them can you can you train her like she's she's got something but we need we need to, we need to help her develop it and that was 20 something years ago um, and I've, I've been working in that space ever since so oh, wow. um, and, and then there's this kind of side part as well, which was my, my my training, my undergrad stuff was in sociology. So I did like sociology and English. So I've had this constant interest in social systems and behaviours and how people hang together and power dynamics, like all of that stuff comes into play as well. Um, so that, you know, that sort of comes together in my work now. I'm just always really curious. A lot of the consultancy work I'm doing is around OD rather than kind of HR or L&D and it's looking at all those systems and looking at all those structures and what works and what doesn't and facilitating conversations accordingly. But I am definitely eclectic. I have a real sort of hodgepodge background. I am interested in lots and lots of things. Um, so sometimes I think I come across as being quite kind of, oh, look, shiny stuff. But um, there, I, I do have some depth to it all as well. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you start working for yourself, Julie? Like setting up um, Fusion Blue's been going for 13 years. Um, first iteration was I was doing interim work. I was helping set up Transport Scotland here in Edinburgh post devolution um, in Scotland. And um and and it started off, honestly, it's just like a holding company. I needed I needed to get paid. So it, yeah. it was thing. Different iterations. Um, so lots of associate work at one point. And in 2012, I went to Ashridge and got um, my MSc in organisational change because I didn't know what I was doing. I was doing. I mean, I demonstrably, I did. Anyone who was working with me at the time and you were paying me, I, I, I did to some extent know what I was doing. <laughs> but this links to what we were talking about before in terms of like your own learning and your development. What Ashridge did was really help me articulate. Oh like this is what I do and this is how I work and I kind of don't do that bit over there but I, but I do this is where I can add value cool. um so yeah and so now it's yeah that's <laughs> pretty much my job Mate, magpie is what you love doing lots of little bits yeah it's 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 like a patchwork it comes together it's I, I, I'm not into kind of terribly shiny stuff if I'm honest there's plenty of folk out there that are doing that Exactly. Uh, my background, um, I fell into the world of booze, and so <laughs> I did. I was a student, and I did the milk round. I had two interviews, one with P&G and one with Bass Brewers. Um, P&G, I clearly did not conform, and if anyone has ever worked with P&G or know any P&Gers, you have to conform, so I didn't. And um, Bass gave me a second interview, and I got on their grad scheme. And I spent the first year of my life in Glasgow at Well Park Brewery. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, and so for the first 12 years of my career, I was in different commercial roles. So I was a salesperson. I was a trade marketeer. Uh, research, that did not fit me very well because that required detail and thinking. So I was Bass Brewers, then Guinness, and then Guinness morphed to Diageo. So by the time I left Diageo in 2008, I was what they termed a global sales capability manager, 
which I think in other languages an L and D manager. But because I was commercial, it was great. So I just got to ping around the world working with sales teams, and that's where I discovered this. But you talk about a shell company. I had a shell company because I was an associate for the first um, seven years yeah. of stepping out. Um, mm -hmm. As you say, you need to get paid um, before I set up the school of facilitation. I think I talk about her is a her, and she was born probably about four years ago um yeah so that's my that's how I came but um where was it that you suddenly noticed your passion or your your love for the facilitation and training element where did that element where did that suddenly start to show up as you look backwards I guess for me it was right back when I was working in the because I was doing this whole I went to university studied speech and language therapy I, I kind of sort of part of me thinks was I ever really desperately des destined to do that anyway but you know that's a very sort of safe career it's a very this is a process you're working with a certain environment that's all regulated etc cetera, etc cetera. and then I just kind of knew after a couple of years that there was something missing and so just being thrown into this whole world of doing something massively different and just working with all these communities and then really and but I struggled to actually do anything with it for a while so until I guess uh, probably 2007 when I actually got trained specifically in facilitation as with the consultancy I was working for and that's when I was like oh yeah that's the thing that's specifically that is the thing for me so yeah. Yeah. What was it, really? I, don't, I, I don't know if I'm honest I don't think I've had a moment where I've gone oh yeah actually this is this is um I'm, I'm all right at this um, I think it's I think it's a sort of a slow creep for me. Um, I do remember so when the the first bunch of stuff that I did was change workshops in the post office, basically with a bunch of hairy arse posties um, who didn't want to be there. Like none of them wanted to be there because they were going to a workshop. They were used to kind of getting up at four o'clock in the morning, doing a shift, and being done by twelve. Um, and and you know some very clever person who paid no attention to them whatsoever had designed a workshop that began at nine o'clock and ran until three. So you know uh, that that wasn't me. Like somebody else did that. And and so we had these people, we had these guys and girls, but primarily guys that were coming up, and they just didn't want to be there at all. Um, and I just remember like loving that conversation. I just remember like the, the the volumes of resistance in the room and me going like, this is gonna happen. Like, so what do we need to do? What conversation do we need to be in to help you either get it or talk about it or reject? It? Like, what is it that we need to do? And I was just like, that I think has been my constant source of fascination. It's like, what what conversation do we need to be in here? Um. And because, I think because I come from that place, I don't try and facilitate people to a point. I'm like, right, what, what is it that we're not talking about? Or what are we talking about? Or, you know, and um, I got into quite a bit of trouble with my co-facilitator sometimes because they were like, you're going off script. And I was like, yeah, but it's there, you know, that they've got a script too and we're paying no attention to some of the stuff that, in my view, is really needing to be said. But I was very raw back then. I was very kind of unformed. So again, if we're talking about development, you know, yeah. I had an I had an instinct or an intuition that that's how I wanted to work, yeah. and that felt really important. But I wasn't very good at articulating it, and I wasn't very good at defending it either. So mm. quite often, oh, oh, actually, maybe I'm wrong. And I was told a lot that I was wrong. Um, you probably weren't. You have to follow the script, and it's got to be pretty, and you've got to. So I, it's lovely now. Because I I'm, uh, I can work off piste a lot more. <laughs> That's much more fun. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because I I mean I I started workshops when I was at, at Diageo, and uh, I was really lucky. I had a great teacher there, a man called Ben Lewis, and who used to be in the room with me as a co-facilitator. Um, so I didn't get told I was wrong too much. He used to stick post-it notes on my back or in the back of my pocket so that I could read them post. Um, a session so I knew why I had to sort of sharpen up and develop but we were good enough friends that he could do that for me but I think um your point that when we start out we are pretty raw and how we do things sometimes it's um there's just an innateness I look back now there was just like an innateness of knowledge or knowing that this is something that I really enjoyed doing but um there was no I didn't have any structures I didn't have 
all the knowledge I have now and that's definitely come over the last 12 years um, and I think we either have really great teachers or in some instances like you were saying you're being told you were wrong so to be able to sort of get through that first to be able to then go no 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 I know I'm, I can do this and and it's having a language because I think one of the things I've definitely developed in the last 12 years is a vocabulary so that yeah. I can hold my space that I can turn to the naysayers and go eh, eh, I, I, I am I know this is right but also a vocabulary that then enables and um, unlocks the group as well which I definitely didn't have 12 years ago um in terms of your personal like call it a personal learning journey what as a facilitator and a trainer what have what have you been through what have you done that's helped you grow as a person you know get over the I'm wrong or I'm not wrong actually that's a good question I think learn when you do it when something does go wrong and to just sort of like really try and learn from it and not to because I think well my reaction maybe is to like oh that was terrible I just don't you know that's that's gone wrong I don't want to think about it but I think to actually go back over it and really maybe give it some space but then go back over it and go okay that didn't work why didn't it work and to try and actually sort of you know own that a bit and then then work with it so I think that's one thing I think also talking about it to other people definitely which I found really hard because I didn't I couldn't find anybody for ages that did what I did <laughs> so it's like, and, and nobody seemed to really know understand what I did so I, I'm talking you know they see the post-it notes or whatever and, and get an idea but not nobody really seemed to get it so that I struggled with that for a while but I think if you can find somebody who knows what you're talking about then I think that's really good to sort of throw back yeah. and forth ideas and sort of say look this didn't work you know what do you think that kind of thing um, and just yeah trying learning going on as many different courses as I could and trying it out in as many different places and doing three things to just you know have a go at the, the new idea I want to try it well I feel like I can't really charge somebody for this I'm going to try it free you know but just just really yeah all of those things I think are, are, for me key um, and, and yeah reading as much as possible watching as much as possible <laughs> No, what did you you said um going on courses helen can you remember any of the courses that you went on that have had an impact for you uh well actually i, I sound like i'm a bit of a um a sort of a, a, a train and uh, one what's the word a one track mind at the moment because and i know ema's listening to this but actually <laughs> really genuinely one of the best courses was going on ema's course last year the graphic facilitation one and I think it's because I'd I'd long held held this idea of making you know flip charts and stuff really pretty as being like I cannot do that and I'm really really jealous of people that can do it and so that was really amazing actually so yeah. that's that's definitely one I think also the um I've done a lot of the technologies of participation workshops and I've, I I use a lot of their stuff I find that those really good as well so um cool. yeah those are two things thank you Julie um. Most impactful on me has been um, the has been dialogue trainings. There's a lady up here in Scotland called Amanda Ridings who um, who does a sort of leadership embodiment stuff and um, and uses dialogue. So uses advocacy and inquiry models. Talks about um, containers for the conversations. So that you check the container in the room and and it was again it was put in a language to things that I possibly intuitively knew or responded to but it just gave me a framework to work with so i i always say like my, my practice is grounded in dialogue not monologue mm -hmm. <laughs> um and um yeah i think that was the beginnings of like the, the working with amanda because she she does whole body stuff so she works with thematic you know energetic how are you in the room? How are other people in the room? How's that impacting on you? Yeah. And then that kind of dialogic stuff about checking how people are speaking. Are they speaking with each other or at each other? Mm -hmm. And then the wraparound for that is paying attention to the conditions in the room. And I think Helen, what, you, what you're saying about um, like the graphic facilitation, I think there's a lovely, that's again, that's the conditions in the room stuff. You know, really, Gives people a good experience or a different experience it allows them to look at what they're doing in a in a different way it's not just words it's capture so all of that stuff comes into play so it's 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 that and hundreds 
of hours in rooms with people. I mean, hundreds <laughs> <laughs> in rooms with people. I'm like, yeah, I've, yeah, I've done my time. <laughs> And have you done any other um, for formal learning? Because that, yeah, have you done any other formal learning over and above the dialogue training? Um, well, I guess like the Ashwood stuff. So that, and that's like that. Most of the things that came out of that was was reflective practice. So lots of the, the, they use action research models. So um, do a thing, um, think about a thing, adjust it, and do it again. So you know. Um, lots and lots of effective practice and lots of writing. So writing is a key part of how I learn and how I reflect as well. So I kind of write stuff down afterwards. In the aftermath of some horrible thing or some magnificent thing happening in the room, I will tend to write it down and go, yeah. how does that come into being? Yeah. Um, and then go away and come back to it a few days later and have a look and see, see what I can make of it. Yeah. Um, and to let other people, so I have supervisors that I work with as well. So. It's not cool. just me saying, oh, this is the world according to Julie. That's very interesting. You know, actually <laughs> bringing people in and chatting to them about it too, I think is really important. Definitely. Um, just a question from the group. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Can Helen and Julie just re-mention the names of the people they trained under? So um, the graphics facilitation um, is with Emo O'Leary and then technology mm -hmm. of participation or TOPS, I think you get it referred to sometimes as well. Institute of Cultural Affairs, ICA.org.uk, I think. Okay. Um, they have a whole series of courses and um, yeah, I, I quite, uh, they kind of link into each other and, and I've done two of those and they're really good. Okay. And I will, um, everyone will get a, a copy of this recording. So I will write an email and I'll put a lot of this information back into our email. Um, and Julie, just mentioned dialogue training with Amanda Ridings. Is that Amanda right? Ridings um, here up here in Scotland, and you might want to look at the Leadership Embodiment. I think it's the Leadership Embodiment Institute, but the work is grounded from a lady called Wendy Palmer, who's based out in America. She's extraordinary. She she's a wee bit like Yoda. She's amazing. Um, <laughs> and then the dialogue stuff. If you're interested in that, um, it's it's Bill Isaacs. Um, he's a he's a little he's a little tiny bit. Uh, I'm going to say white male academic. There's a little bit of that comes in. However, <laughs> but, I wonder what you're going to say. <laughs> well, it's a wee bit like it's a little bit theoretical. If I'm honest, okay. you have to, you've got you've got to be able to think about how you put it into practice. But the stuff around containers and checking in the room to see if you've got things like trust and honesty. It, it codifies it, so it's quite useful. Yeah. My, um, my learning has come from, it's the formal learning piece, so I just persuaded Diageo to pay for my NLP training. So um, got all of that paid for. Thank you very much, Diageo, I appreciate that. Um, so I did all my master practice. That gave me a bit of an aha of, oh, and I know some people buy into it and some people don't, so let's just put that to one side. But it did just give me the aha of, oh, this is what rapport is. This is how people connect. It's, it really opened me up that there were there was stuff going on that I was just totally unaware of. Um, and then another bit of formal learning, um, Systemic Constellations, I've done that in the last four years, and that's just mm. massively eye-opening. So when, Julie, you're talking about, you know, the dialogue piece, the embodiment piece, um, that's where I've really got into that and using my energy and sensing into the room. Um, I've learned that through my systemic work with the whole partnership. Ed Rowland. Um, and then I think just to, I'm reading my notes, but the you know, hours of practice, I think that just is standard for all of us. Um, if you wanna be good at something, you've gotta keep practicing it. But as um, Matt Saeed talks about in Bounce, you can do something for hours and hours and hours, but unless you purposely practice and then purposely reflect and get that feedback loop in place, it means absolutely nothing. So um, yeah, so the self-reflection is really useful. And the writing, I do do that. But then the piece that I'd really like to come to is the supervisors or coaches or mentors. Um, because that's something that I've definitely utilized in the last 10 years, is having a coach or I've got some really good 
I call them my guides. I've got really good guides who I can talk to. So um, I was just curious for you guys, who who have been your guides on your journey? Oh, my guides on my journey. I think it's been different people at different times, to be honest. Um, and yeah, because I've been through different sort of phases of doing this. So when I was working in international development, that was, you know, people who are in that sort of area. And then when I worked with a number of charities, it's, so it's been different people. I think recently it's, um, I have a business coach and um, I've been through two or three different business coaches. <laughs> I've got a new one now. And uh, also I'm part of the um, uh, IAF the International Association of Facilitators. And so they, like uh, you guys have your sort of, um, you know, your meet, meeting up uh, sessions, I, they have sessions as well. So I sort of link in with them quite a bit. Um, and I'm part of several different sort of networks, I think. And some of them are more leaning towards, you know, learning and development and that kind of thing. And some of them are like, I'm part of a freelance mum group, for example. And, and that's really important to me because they're, also mums you know that have young kids that they have to work around so I think they're different things for different parts of what I do um yeah, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question yeah and Julie um very similar I would say I think that's a that that pretty much covers it like different different combinations for different things I work formally with a supervisor um, and I have done uh probably for about the last 10 years in different in different guys it's not the same one but for different things um I tend to work with people who are um gonna agitate me um and, and push my like really help me push my practice I, I prefer my supervisor to be someone who will take no nonsense um from me because I'm quite good at nonsense you know I can <laughs> um and so I, I I'm quite careful about who I work with um and I sort of I interview them, but you know I take it really seriously. I think it's really important. So I'll ask for recommendations, um, and I'll spend a wee while with them and just kind of check if if it's the right fit. In the same way that I would want someone to do that with me if I was coaching them, you know, so that sort of thing. And then there's all the lovely informal stuff, and you know, my personal learning network and all the things that come through twitter and linkedin and the people who make me kind of scratch my head and go really how oh ah i hadn't thought about that before um and the other people who make me scratch my head and go how are you still doing that thing like that's not a thing surely oh maybe it's a thing well there we go um i thought we'd moved on oh well so um yeah but i think i think the supervision thing is really important and and peer networks and just being able to go somewhere um and process out um because it facilitation with people in transition and um it can be quite complicated and it can be quite gnarly in the room sometimes and you know there could be emotion or or apathy or whatever and it for me it's really useful to speak to other folk about when this happens what do you do or yeah. what else is going on around this that i would need to think about or work with so yeah that's stuff um and, and i'm the same so i've always had a coach in the last 10 years i'm I'm curious um you talk about a supervisor is that a supervisor for the coaching or the facilitation my, my whole practice i don't i don't separate it out so i have someone who supervises me because i'm coach consultant facilitator however you, whatever words you want to put on around them so it's someone who coaches my whole practice um because there's a good chance if i'm not doing something in the room when i'm facilitating i'm not willing to ask a question or if I'm intimidated by a situation or I'm being overly protective in, in the room, mm. there's a good chance that's also showing up in my coaching practice. There'll be something yeah. about me that's, you know, holding me back or or making me really clumsy if I'm if I'm being too forthright. So I work with a supervisor in my whole practice. Okay. That's really useful. I um, um, like Helen I've also I've worked with a business coach on very specific parts of my, of my yeah. business and my business practice. I'm the same. So it, it goes in um, cycles. So there are times that I work with a business coach. So at the moment I'm working with a finance coach to really sort of sharpen up um, on my practice there. Um, but then having a, 
a coach coach to sort my shit out and if any of you have ever heard me talk about it before I, I think that we're in the business of helping others but we really have to help ourselves first and therefore we need to make sure that we're emotionally resourced physically resourced mentally resourced and for me a coach brings that emotional resource um and if you don't sort your own shit out it just shows up in the room. So just how you described it, Julie, like, do I then resist asking a certain question or do I notice I'm getting a physical reaction to a conversation that's happening around me? Um, and then your that's your cue or clue that says, actually, I'm, I'm no use to man or beast at this point because there's something that I haven't sorted out. Um, I've got a I've just done, I've got a little poll that I want to put out to the group. And um, it's a really simple question. And it says. Um, who has used a coach to support their personal growth so i'm just really curious for all of you out there who are listening to us um the poll should now be open uh oh she says i think i put it out there so how many of you have used a coach in the past so you can select yes or no I... So people are collecting the responses. I love this. 81% of you have voted. 86% of you have voted. I'm guessing some people might be on the telephone. Oh, 90%. So we've got, I think that's everybody. Final chances. <laughs> So if I close it, I think then you can all see it, she says. <clears throat> Voila. Um, so 89% of us have used, either have a coach or have used a coach, and 11% uh, haven't. Um, what do you think the benefits are of having that supervisor or coach in your space? For me, I think it's partly holding me accountable because I am a massive, um, yeah, I think like Julie was saying earlier, I quite like doing lots of different things. So I think sort of actually bringing me back and saying, well, did you, you know, what was the outcome of that? Did you do that thing? You know, you went off and chased that. And what about this other thing? And so for me, just kind of reining me in a bit, maybe, um, because I do have a tendency to, to lose myself. Um, I think also just to kind of talk through sort of, you know, I often have a lot of stuff going on in my head <laughs> to kind of be able to offload that and to get some yeah. sort of, you know, response back from that and, and just to step outside of me sometimes and, you know, otherwise I can get lost in myself. So, yeah, I suppose those two things, there's probably lots of things, but. Julie, what are, your, what, what are the benefits to you? Um, sharpness. Um, Clarity and um, articulation. That's it's, it's basically those two things. It keeps me sharp, keeps me, it helps me be clear, kind of cleans me off a wee bit, um, and it helps me articulate. And if I can articulate whatever it is um, to myself or or to somebody else, it, it usually lessens it a wee bit. You know, or I can do something with it if I can articulate it. If I if I can't articulate it, I can't do anything about it. It's just, it's just nebulous and weird. So that I, I use it for that. <laughs> well, um, for me, uh, having the coach, I've used different coaches at different times. So I've just found that they've helped me sort my shit out in whatever space needs to be sorted um, or is shouting the loudest to be looked at. Um, <laughs> Mitra, thank you. My coach would keep me focused and allow me to talk things through to gain confidence in my own ability. I think that's really true. Um, um, a question for you all. Okay, here's another question. Um, what qualities do you think facilitators and trainers need to be good at what they do? Because <laughs> you could have many qualities, I guess. The chocolate, didn't we? Yes. Sorry, Kirsty. I had to. Um, qualities. Um, you can have chocolate. So, so, like, honestly, um, a bit of empathy and a bit of sensitivity goes a long way um, mm -hmm. in the room. Um, just not being a git um, helps. 
And um, I'm quite big on that. I'm quite big on just don't be a git, like, or, you know, whatever version of that you prefer. Um, I and I think that, check your ego um, is quite, is quite important. Uh, Do you think people still facilitate with their ego? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> do, do I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Not, not, not the good ones. Not anyone that I would work with. But yeah, that, that's yeah. Stuff. There are still egos out there. Um, Helen, what do you notice? What qualities? Yeah, and I think follow. It, it's like it's, it's not about you. It's about them. You know, it's not the me show or the you show, or whatever. It's you have like an interdependency with you and your participants. And I think so. Being able to do that and to have that kind of build that relationship, I think, is whatever you call that quality. But that that way of working, I think, for me, is is really critical. Um, I think being able to articulate and be clear about things which sometimes I need to check myself on but you know this idea of, of sort of I, I you know not going off and rambling on uh, on about something but actually if you're particularly if you're asking people questions you know to be able for them to be able to answer questions you need to yeah. be very clear about what you're asking um, and I think it sort of goes without saying really but really good listening and you know the whole active listening and not just pretending you're listening to people um, yeah, I think <laughs> I've I've been in situations where you know you a, a participant and you know the person is sort of a, the facilitator trainer or whatever has, has asked a question and then me or somebody else has, has responded and they've just sort of yeah nodded moved on and it's oh. not because they're doing the you know I need to kind of move on talk to other people thing it's because yeah. they're not really listening properly and you can really tell and it's yeah, yeah. That really annoys me. <laughs> One of uh, the qualities I think a good facilitator or trainer has is the ability to ask great questions. Yeah. Um, and and those insight, insightful, incisive questions that sort of can be quite I'm lazy. Not sure I have that sometimes. Pardon? I'm not sure I have that sometimes. <laughs> um, I no, yeah, I think you're right. But sometimes, I, yeah. I, I, yeah sorry i just think that if you can't if, if we're talking about um the, like really good facilitation isn't it like pulling people into the conversation rather than pushing down ideas so i just find my language and having great questions is is a way of doing that otherwise i i guess i don't do it but i have seen others do it it just becomes you know their show and they're doing a lot of talking at and it's that sort of one-way communication which then for me just turns it into a, a presentation or a bit of I don't know, monologue as you called it earlier rather than a dialogue. Um, so I can cover with everything you said. We've got a couple of questions coming in and I just want to put them and I don't know if people can see these. So one from Rich, which is what what best ways do you know to set up and communicate healthy boundaries with a group? That's a good question. Um, hmm. I suppose that you're talking about I mean, things like what people call sort of ground rules and that kind of thing. Is that maybe? I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I I tend to sort of um, I don't call them ground rules if there are any because I find the word rules can sort of put people off a little bit. Um, so I usually invite people to to sort of talk about you know the environment and the space they're in and. And, you know, are, are there things that are important to you today that we need to, to sort of include and do and not do? And so try and, I suppose, invite a bit of a, a conversation about it. And then if there are, I mean, there can be, think, if you mean things like, you know, don't turn off your or turn off your mobile phones and that kind of thing, then maybe that's part of it. But it can be more about, um, yeah, I suppose, uh, respecting each other and what each other says. And, and then, yeah, we can write that up, I suppose, sometimes. It, I don't often... Yeah, I, I try not to formalise that bit too much sometimes, I suppose. I'm not sure if that answers the question. <laughs> well, I, think that's, I, I think that's really useful. Um, I, I tend to ask folk, like, how, how do you want to work today? Yeah. How are you? What, what space are you in sort of thing? And how do you want to work today? I think um, if, if I've been told before I go in the room that they are, that something's running, so quite often you'll, you'll hear the gossip, you know, the client will say to you or somebody will say to you, well, you know, that such and such doesn't get on with such and such, and this is happening, and there's this context. And mm -hmm. um, 
and I'll often kind of go, what's the conversation that we need to have today? Or what's the conversation that we, we shouldn't have today? <laughs> As well. What's the conversation we shouldn't be having today? Or, you know, something like that. So you, you, you're surfacing bits yeah. and pieces already. But I'm not sure that helps with the boundaries. Like, the boundary stuff is, are they going to be respectful of each other and nice to each other and listen to each other and not hurt each other? And, you know, how do we make sure it's, it's not, it doesn't become a a grandstanding for an individual or a, you know so I think I think some of that is intervention on our part if you look at John Heron's stuff on intervention you know you can confront the situation or you can kind of convene you know there's there's different ways of looking at what our intervention is yeah. so I think we have a part in that there is a, there is a definite thing at the beginning where we invite people to think about how they're going to use their time and their space together but then once you're in it and once you once folks start doing the thing and the dynamic starts to play out in the room, um, yeah, I think I think we have a role around our own boundaries to to mm. hold them um, yeah. to, and and hold them to account. It's like it's like you were saying before, Helen, about yeah, holding holding people to account is part of that too. I think. Oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Great question. I love that uh, question. One of Mr. Bellas as ever. He's got more. Um, I don't know if I have time to answer more. My my piece is I think uh, we we role model as well the behaviours we want our groups to see. So it's really simple things, and um, and I also think it depends what kind of um, event or workshop you've got going on. So sometimes if you're in that very training skill based behavioural based um, workshop, which I've done a lot of, I call out up front very early on morning one. Um, how are you going to be? How are we going to work together? some noticings you may have about your own learning as you're going through. So I'm quite blunt and put it in the room. Um, mm. And then there have been workshops where I facilitated and I knew that there could be some sticky conversations in the room. So I put up some resources on the wall, which I invited everybody to read about active listening or um, how they're gonna show up. So again, by subterfuge, but not being blunt. But I think also how we act and behave mm. is really, really important because people what people watch and listen with their eyes. So they're going to be looking at you all the time to see what you're doing. So if they're in the middle of an exercise and you're on your phone, guess what they're going to think they've got permission to go and do, even though yeah. you know that's not what you want to do. So it's little things like that that make the world of difference. Christy, you're um, making me a better person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm really shit at it sometimes. Um, I'm like, oh my god, yeah, like I totally, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I do not tend to use my phone in the room. Um, but the role modelling thing, I think I get a little bit scared of that because I'm like, oh Christ, you know, I've, I've got, <laughs> I've got to be a role model as well as everything else. And I think you're right, by the way. I'm not disagreeing with it, but there's, there's a lot goes on when you facilitate, which is why I think it's really important for folk to pay attention to it. No, it's yeah, not and um, practice your facilitation because you're always juggling plays because you're managing the environment, you're managing a potential a hotel space, you're there for the group, you're there for the knowledge, you're managing yourself. Um, yeah, there's many, many spinning plates. And um, there's a couple more questions. Um, one from Silvana, which is how do you create psychological safety? I, I think it's, it's back to some of the stuff that Helen was saying at the start. So you, yeah. you know, you, what do you mean to continue? And you, and you can't, um, again, my view is we can only do part of that. So we, we set the environment so that it's not gonna be intimidating. Like for some people, a circle of chairs with no tables in, so no psychological safety whatsoever, and yet we do it. We're like, oh yeah, you know, we've got to put people in the circle with chairs, like it's gonna make them feel better. Actually, no, it doesn't, you know, for some people, just that's like that's like terrorism it's like ah so i think um i think we've got to be responsive and we've got to be careful about our choices um and then if we do decide that we're going to give folk a, a circle to sit in with no boundaries in front of them we then have to work the circle so that it feels like a nice place to be um and you know for some people they don't have that they're like oh yeah it's cool we're sitting in a circle that feels really nice so i, I think i think we have a part to play i mean if we we need to be pretty clear about what our part is in it. Um, but the psychological safety is sometimes not running in the 
in the in the group anyway so you've got to keep checking in with them and if you see nasty stuff running yeah you know, if you see someone who's constantly giving it a wee bit of whatever at the side yeah. like, calling that out i think is really important um yeah and i think sometimes trying to prepare like if you know i'm just thinking now actually i've got a workshop tomorrow that i know is going to be quite a contentious one in fact that's why i'm being brought in to do it and um so one of the things is i i've worked quite a lot with the person the person who's actually brought me in to do it to try and understand the group a bit better um so that i can try and work in the best way that i can to ensure yeah their psychological or other safety because i know that there's so we've talked about how you know putting certain people together and not putting other people together and all that kind of stuff so a lot of the groundwork before i even get there has gone in yeah. to, to trying to make sure this is the best um environment as possible um yeah but, great um yeah. let me just go to the slides um one question we had from one of the group was how how have you developed your facilitation design knowledge? That was quite a good one. On the job, <laughs> chatting to other folk. Uh, yeah, definitely. Reading, I've got a few. Um, virtual facilitation is something I've recently become more interested in. Not because I love it, but because I know I need to embrace it and learn more about it, and I'm slightly scared of it. So I've got a lovely book that I haven't yet read, but I think, yeah, trying to really sort of see what other people are doing. And... Yeah. Um, I've had just some good teachers and also a lot of self learn and then sticking it together and codifying it and working out what what works and what doesn't work and it's back to something you said earlier Helen and Judy is just lots and lots of hours of practice and noticing what works and doesn't work there's loads of stuff out there's so many resources you know and I think we're so lucky now we've got so well are we lucky or not I don't know but social media you know yeah. but there's so many blogs to read and so many you know uh, well, I don't know websites to go to it's amazing yeah I have to say, I do get a bit overwhelmed. So I suddenly yeah. see these people are instructional designer, and I'm like, what the hell is one of them? And uh, I could lose I hours. And I'm what like, oh, I do that. So I think um, some reading. And then there's another question. Oh, I've not put it there. I'll be facilitating my first senior leadership gathering. The focus is to create a leadership charter on ways of working. Um, how should I approach this? And any advice you could give? Uh, find out the context why they want it um, I would divide and conquer I would always try and speak to as many of the people who are likely to come before they come um, yeah. to find out the ideas I think, I think you can shortcut an awful lot of stuff that might like that's a that, potentially that's a big topic and depending on how long you've got so making some assumptions about what you're saying so my yeah. assumptions are you know, you've got a day or an afternoon or something um, if it's a leadership charter underlying assumption is that they're all going to sign up to it um, I think there's always a wee bit of work to be done before that happens um, and getting them to think about what would happen if they don't use it as well is quite useful so if you, if you, if you write this damn thing and you put it out in the organisation and you don't do it what are the consequences yeah. of that but if you're looking for practical steps oh, you know, yeah there's loads of stuff out there it's a longer conversation Sorry. Yeah. My one is um, be really clear on the outcomes that you're looking to achieve in that time. I think that's always one of mine. And then whatever you design in terms of a flow, hold it really lightly because it's going to change. Um, mm -hmm. And be be okay with the change that's likely to occur. Um, but so long as you hold those outcomes in your mind, you'll get there. Yeah, it's like if they're if they're if they're used to like running around you know and you need to cat herd them i think holding to the holding them to the process fairly firmly can be useful if you've got a bunch of people who are really process heavy pushing them out of the process a wee bit and getting them to be a bit more creative can be the thing so I, you, it's about understanding who you're going to have in the room and what the context is and what they're after and how they're going to use it because you can sit that. and make a beautiful thing yeah. but so what you know that's that's nice yeah. i think well that's a good point of a conversation and allow time for it how are we going to use it how is it going to show up in the business how are we going to show up in the business as a result of spending a couple of days as angela said to um to do this um any thoughts from you 
Helen? Yeah, just I, I, all of what you've said, really. I um, mean, I suppose on practical stuff, um, when it comes it comes to sort of creating charters or whatever mission statements or that kind of thing, I think um, you know I often start with with playing around with the words, playing around with the language, finding out what people mean by certain things. So having a real kind of open um, open start to it, you know, before sort of diving in and trying to you know write something or get it all down in a you know very sort of logical specific way I think just have some time to let it breathe and play around with it to start with um yeah so you yeah you, you get to I think often we leap forwards to, to the end quite quickly you know we need to start with the end and we need to start with knowing where we're trying to get to but we often yeah. try and rush forwards to that point without giving it the time to breathe and I, I think that's hard to say that when if you've only got whatever three hours I don't know how long you know no so she's just got a couple of days so that's okay uh, so yeah that's but sometimes good. you only get given you know I've been in situations where I've only been given sort of half a day to come up with something that's far too monumental for that half a day and that's really yeah. hard to kind of um to, to be able to do that but if possible yeah give it give yourselves a chance to sort of play around with things a bit cool well um we've nearly come to the full hour um one book that you have enjoyed reading and that's helped you just sort of throw that in at the end oh blimey one book I could uh, read. I'm back with Bill Isaacs academic who he is um the 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 dialogue uh, the art of the dialogue and the art of conversation is uh, still a touchstone I still go back to that and David Bowen stuff on um uh, also called it. There's a really good one. I keep forgetting the name of it. They're called the Skill Facilitator Handbook that I quite like dipping out in and out of. So that's quite good. It's quite a chunky thing. Um, yeah. And there's one that I don't actually own, but it's called The Art of Focused Conversation. And I can't remember who wrote it, but it's about a specific um, focused conversation being a specific sort of methodology. That's quite nice one as well. So. Um, I'll find that. I'll try and look those both up. Um, you said David. David Bowen. It's a, a Bowen. Bowen. Um, it's um there's an essay I'll, I'll get it you, there's a pdf which is probably illegal but never mind on the internet which i can, I can send over here um, it's just it's a, it's a yeah it's just a little essay it's not like a huge book or anything it's, it's, my um my current favorite book is game storming which oh yes that's what that. there is oh, another one. nice I love it. Um, so if anyone's looking for inspiration for um, activities and exercises, game storming, again, I'll put a link to it because that just has. Oh, she's going to the shop. I was looking behind my, me as well. <laughs> yep, that's it. I'll tell you another one that's nice is um, this. Oh, hang on, where's the camera? It's called The Workshop Book by Pamela Hamilton. Yeah. That's quite nice as well. Yeah. If you actually want loads of practical stuff. Yeah, we've had a my good library's there. right next to me. <laughs> we have got, and we've got the same library there. Maybe we'll start doing the library of facilitators. And um, Rich just <laughs> said it's called On Dialogue, David Bowen, B O H N. But again, I'll look that all up. And we um, we should think about a book club. Oh, facilitator <laughs> book club. Who'd be up for a facilitator book club? But, or but then, I've been thinking about that for a while. I thought like a book club because I'm not, you know, I'm I. I need to be forced to kind of read. I dip in and out. Yeah, I'm a bit like that. <laughs> We're getting yeses. Sophie's up for it. Ema's up for it. Um, Sean, Angel. Okay, I will. I'll talk to these lovely ladies and let's uh, do it. Start looking. Who facilitates? Who facilitates? Facilitators. I know. Hardest job like. in the world trying to facilitate facilitators. I reckon. Do you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I mean, in a way, you know, they're probably all going to play nicely because they know how, you know, what it's like to well, they have the inner monologue going in their heads that they don't want to play nicely because they just want to yeah, challenge maybe not. Maybe they want to be disruptors. Who knows? Who knows? Um, I'm going to say thank you because uh, I appreciate uh, people probably need to go. Um, Thank you uh, to you guys, Julie and Helen, for um, joining in today. And I'd just like to say a massive thank you to everybody who's been listening and who has shared their thoughts, asked their questions, um, and helped deal with GoToWebinar and given me other suggestions of what to use in the future. Um, the next online gathering is in um, May, and it will be an open circle. So just bring your issues, your ideas, and your problems. Um, I think Helen, when's your next open workshop down in the southwest? It's the nineteenth of uh, June. I have to think about cool. that. Cool. And uh, Julie, you've got what on this week? So if you're in Edinburgh, 
The Edinburgh facilitation shindig is tomorrow and the London one is May the, uh, I'm going with 17th, it might be 15th. Okay. Uh, and I've got design class on May the 10th if anybody is around and fancies coming down to London town. And I'm going to announce it here today and the newsletter will go out this week. Uh, Ema and I are collaborating. On the 19th of July, we're going to do a graphic facilitation class uh, with SOF. So if anyone is in Brilliant. the um, South and wants to come and uh, improve their graphic facilitation, um, you can work with Ema and myself. Nice. I'm just going to be there as the host, and Ema's going to do all her amazing cool stuff. Brilliant. So, a mashup, but it's, uh, yeah, 19th of July, put it in your diaries, just before the madness of the summer holidays start. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Much appreciated. And uh, we'll see you all again soon.